in an ideal world, I would love to see veterinary technicians and veterinary medical students being educated together through their four years, because there are so many things that are foundational to the success of both. And what an amazing opportunity and a safe, controlled environment of school and um, having, you know, trained instructors, facilitators to help to, you know, to model this. Welcome to the Vet Life Reimagined podcast. My guest today is Virginia Corrigan, and from a young age, Virginia had the budding interest in animal medicine and teaching. She will talk about her vet school experience, her master of public health degree, and residency in advanced canine and feline practice, but she really thrives in places where she can learn and teach. Virginia's journey has been one of mentorship, and it was a good mentor who told her about an opportunity leading a brand new online veterinary technician program through Appalachian State University in North Carolina. We talk about the importance of advancing veterinary education and some of the ways that it's happening today. This is a fantastic conversation. So on to Virginia. Let's go back to where it started. When did you know you first wanted to get into veterinary medicine? Yes, I was one of those kids who knew she was going to be a veterinarian from a very young age. I've listened to your podcast and I've heard the stories and my story isn't too terribly different from a lot of your guests. I actually, it's funny because the picture I have behind my computer is actually a picture of me when I was about seven years old holding my cat, Magic, and it's there to remind me of that really beautiful moment where I just knew that's exactly what I wanted to do. I loved animals. I was a barn kid. I was always with horses and cats and they were kind of, you know, that's, that's where I was the most happy and comfortable when I was with my friends and and with animals. And so I, I just knew, and I remember writing an essay when I was in grade school, what do you want to be when you grow up? And of course it was, you know, to be a veterinarian. Uh, but I, I'd like to add something to that. I, I thought about as I reflected on that question, because I, I knew you were going to ask it. I also always knew I was going to be an educator. And it's funny when I think about this, because I can always remember the moment where I knew I was going to be a veterinarian. Secretly, when I was that same age, when I'd come home from the barn after being there for hours and hours and hours on end, I was a working student, so I could afford afford to ride horses and be at the barn, I would come home and I would make tests and quizzes and flashcards for my friends on all of the horse breeds and all of the different um, like history of equestrian sports. And that honestly, that moment didn't come back to me until I was talking about this with another friend. And I said, oh, wow, I was also always meant to be an educator because I really like those two things have always gone hand in hand for me. And I didn't know it until very recently. Oh, I love that. <laughs> Making flashcards for your friends. I I just, I think that's so perfect. So what was getting into vet school like? What was that journey for you? Well, I'm wearing orange today in <laughs> honor of the University of Tennessee, Go Vols. So my journey to vet school, I don't think went as smoothly as I would have liked. When I was in college at Miami University of Ohio, I I knew that that was my path. But at the same time, I was around a lot of pre-med students and they kind of swayed me towards maybe going to medical school. And so I spent some time in human medicine and uh, shadowing and, you know, it was actually a really good thing because I learned, actually, I don't want to be a doctor for humans. I really do want to be a doctor for animals. And so um, I spent a lot of time volunteering in different types of healthcare settings and maybe not as much in a veterinary healthcare setting as I should have because the Ohio State University actually had pretty high their requirements for a number of clinical hours that you had to get in uh, were really, really high. And it turned out when I met with my advisor, I just didn't quite meet that number because I had such a diversity of experience. So we kind of sat down and I said, well, what should I do? And he said, well, let's, you know, why don't you try applying to some out-of-state schools? Let's see what happens. So I applied to a handful of -of out-of-state schools, ended up just getting one interview at the University of Tennessee. I went down, uh, I'd been to Knoxville before, I had um, some experience there, and I had my interview, and I was the last interview of the day. I remember sitting very nervously for an extended period of time. I actually cried in my interview because I was so nervous. It wasn't tears of fear, it was like 
hot tears of I'm so nervous. Um, and at the end, um, they said, it's OK, you did fine. Um, but I just, you know, I drove back up to Miami of Ohio is four hours away. And I was like, I'm not getting in. My life is over. <laughs> But we, you know, lo and behold, I get a letter. Um, I remember walking across the quad at Miami University and my mom sent me the letter and I opened it and I called my mom and I was just screaming because they let me in. I can't believe it. They let me in, which I still can't believe to this day. But I'm, I'm really fortunate and super proud grad of University of Tennessee. And I went there and graduated in 2010. Aww. What an awesome story. It sounds like you must have had a, a good experience overall because you're still wearing the colors. So <laughs> I like being able to reflect on your experience as a student yourself, because as someone who is interested in, in education, that might help you also think about, you know, what was good, what was what could be better in, you know, making a, a, a wonderful future for future veterinary students and, and veterinary technician students. So going through vet school, did you have an idea of how being a veterinarian would look like for you going in? Did that change? What was that like? Yes, that changed a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and in a wonderful, wonderful way. When I when I got to vet school, I was pretty dead set that I would be an equine veterinarian. I spent my childhood uh, with horses. I rode hunter jumper equestrian. I actually went to nationals and rode in nationals instead of going to my college graduation. Um, <laughs> I was I was just really that that horse girl, and you know, in my heart, I still am. So that was my thought. Um, fortunately for me at Tennessee, we did not track. So we got to do a little bit of everything. And I took a lot of courses in equine. And I also took a lot of small animal courses. And I started doing some courses in public health, just really tried to diversify my experience. And I also jumped into opportunities outside the classroom. And I have to say that that was one of the best things that I did. And if I had to give any pieces of advice to students now, I would say do that. Uh, don't spend all your time in class and in the library and studying. I hadn't had a lot of leadership roles in my past and I was nervous about it and didn't really, you know, a lot of imposter syndrome being in vet school. I remember sitting in the first year classroom and the second year student who was the SAVMA representative, the student AVMA representative came in and said, we need a new SAVMA representative. So who would like to do it? And, you know, everybody said, oh, I'm too busy. I'm studying so hard. Vet school is hard. And I kind of just looked around and nobody was raising their hands. I said, sure, I'll do it. And, you know, through that experience, just a whole host of cascading events occurred. And so I'd say it was a combination of really diving into all the different areas of medicine, as well as these different leadership and experiential education opportunities that are really changed my whole trajectory. And when I was in fourth year, I was trying to decide between would I do an internship in mixed animal, so equine and small animal, or just small animal? And I ended up having a really fantastic conversation with the mentor who encouraged me to really consider going to small animal because just, you know, kind of talking it through, we said, that sounds like that's really where your heart is. And it, and it truly was. So I made the decision to pursue a small animal internship. And that was the way that my career went. And has taken multiple turns along the way. And I found myself in a position where if someone had told me now or then what I'd be doing now, I don't think that I would have believed them at all. So it's really fascinating to think about uh, where veterinary medicine can take you. And I really am an advocate for experiencing a lot of different areas of the profession, uh, networking, connecting, just seeing what's out there, because I never would have known that all of these things are possible. Yeah. Since you brought it up, let's talk about those twists and turns, because I think that's one way to to show some of these different experiences that are even out there. That's one of the, the big parts of this podcast. From internship, how did you get to the next step in this twisty, turny journey? <laughs> twisty, turny journey. I really like that. Okay. So I graduated in 2010. I went off to Denver, Colorado, and I did an internship at Alameda East Veterinary Hospital, which is a, a VCA hospital. If, if you don't know it, it's a very large 
general practice and emergency and specialty hospital. It used to be on the on TV, but it fortunately wasn't when I was there because that would have been very, very terrifying. Uh, there was an Animal Planet show that used to film there. When I was in my internship, I decided that I would actually like to be an ophthalmologist because it came to me that if I became an ophthalmologist, I could work on horses and small animals. And I just love eyeballs. Some some of us crazy people do. And I really enjoyed um, taking care of those cases. And I spent time with the local ophthalmologist. And, you know, I, I said, okay, I'm gonna go for it. And just like kind of, you know, back to when I applied and had a bit of a roadblock, that happened for me again, as, as, as I remember hearing when I was young, kind of the lights turned red for me again, instead of green. So I applied for an residency and, and didn't get it. And so uh, I said, well, what's next? You know, what do I, what do I want to do? And, you know, of course, outside of veterinary medicine, I had uh, a significant other at the time and decided it's really best for me to go back closer to where he is. And, you know, let's see where this goes. And so I went back and did I joined a practice in Charlotte, North Carolina, where I worked for two years in general practice at emergency. And through that experience, I learned a lot because it was the first time that I was put by myself on, in the middle of the night. And fortunately, because of that internship experience and the amazing mentorship that I had there, I did it. And it wasn't fun at times. And there was some crying and there was you know, stress, but there was a lot of laughter and I made some amazing friends there and, and we did it, you know, and and what I learned through that was uh, number one, I'm not a night owl. So I was doing a lot of the overnight shifts At, at 20 something totally possible. However, after seven nights of that, uh, my husband used to call me the vampire zombie because I was not very pleasant to be around. And it just, you know, my, my, clock is more like a 4 a.m. to 8 p.m. versus an 8 p.m. to 4 a.m. kind of internal clock. So I learned that and that was important to learn about myself. I also learned that I really loved working with the interns. So we were really lucky. It was a big enough practice that we had a rotating internship program. So we had two or three interns uh, each year for the two years that I was there. And I discovered when I was on the swing shift with the interns that that was my favorite part. Because um, not only were, was I not alone, but I was also, um, you know, we were working together as a team and I was teaching them some things. They were teaching me some things and it was so much fun and it was so rewarding. So after two years and I discovered that emergency medicine wasn't going to really be the end all be all for me, I discovered that what about academia? You know, I think that that inner knowing came to me and I said, I really love this teaching part. And could I do that and be a veterinarian at the same time? So I discovered that the Virginia Maryland College of Veterinary Medicine had a very unique residency program, still do. And it's a residency in ABVP, which is the American Board of Veterinary Practitioners. And they had a canine feline residency spot open. I went up to Blacksburg, Virginia, and I met with the team and with my soon-to-be mentor, and a light bulb completely went off for me. I felt at home. I felt like this is exactly where I need to be, and I took a huge pay cut, and I went and moved to Blacksburg. Uh, We got married. Actually, that significant other turned out to really be the, the love of my life. We got married in Hawaii. Then we moved to Blacksburg and I started my residency. I was fortunate enough to be able to do a master's in public health concurrently with my residency, which my mentor helped me to design. So I was there for three years to do that. And I fell in love with academia and veterinary medical education. And so I was really fortunate fortunate that they asked me to stay. So I was a faculty member at Virginia, Maryland for another five years. So I was there for for eight years total. Wow. So where did the the public health interest come in? Sure. Well, when I was at the University of Tennessee, it, it definitely started there because the dean at the time who transitioned out of being the dean and, and then a new dean stepped in uh, was Dr. Michael Blackwell, who is, of course, a very prominent figure in veterinary medicine and an incredible hero and mentor. He was very inspiring when it came to the role of veterinarians in public health. And I took some classes when I was in vet school and there there was a pathway to get your MPH in vet school. Um, However, I just 
Um, I felt like my bucket was pretty full at the time. And that was just one thing I wasn't going to be able to manage. Um, but it was, it was on my list. I said, I'm going to finish this somehow, some way. So when I went to Virginia, Maryland, um, traditionally, all of the residents did a research-based master, so an MS in biomedical science. And I asked my mentor, I said, well, I'm, I'm really more interested in a master's of public health. Do you think I could do that? And a really good friend of mine actually was at Virginia, Maryland at the time, completing her equine internal medicine residency, and she converted hers to an MPH as well. And so, so I kind of followed her lead and I was able to transition to that MPH. And what, what was amazing about it was my mentor, I have many mentors, I have a network of mentors, but I will say um, this particular mentor uh, has been incredibly impactful for me in my life because she really opened the door to showing me how public health and the human animal bond are just this beautiful field and so completely fascinating. So I was actually able to focus my MPH in the human animal bond. And I did coursework through the University of Colorado and their social work program, and uh, was able to focus on areas like animal-assisted intervention, so therapy animals, service animals. Uh, we did a lot of outreach activities, so we actually helped run a therapy animal organization at Virginia Tech, and we worked with a local service dog training organization. We had a puppy raising program where the puppies would come in. I have one of them who didn't make it through the program. He still <laughs> lives with me. So it was just, it was, it was so eye-opening, and I think it's really interested me in this idea of interprofessional education because I was in classes with, um, you know, social work students and uh, psychology students. And of course, with, through my MPH, I was also with, you know, with the veterinary students who, with whom I was, you know, interacting in different types of classrooms in the clinic. So we were all just like mingled together. And and it really taught me a lot about the role of veterinarians in really protecting and promoting that human animal bond and how that leads to so many different areas of public health. It's kind of the heart, I think, of where veterinarians um, kind of find themselves is that intersection, that human animal bond. So so that's where it came from. And, and I was so fortunate to be able to pursue that. Oh, wow. No, you definitely hit on a, a passion topic of my own and really learning from all different types of disciplines and specialties inside, outside of veterinary medicine. I think it's a, a way to advocate for ourselves too, let people know that we exist and that we have a huge role to play, but also, you know, learning from them. So I really like that you were able to embrace that opportunity in, in that educational setting. So what happened next after you, you mentioned you were there for quite a number of years? Where where did you move to next? Sure. So fast forward to 2021, kind of towards the tail end of COVID, I think. It's hard to remember. <laughs> um, you know, life, life had many turns during that time. I uh, am now a mother of three children, and that all happened during that time. Um, uh, five, three, and and one at this point, and um, it was it was time for a change. You know, it was time to to spread my wings and um, and to discover um, where I could really make a positive impact in veterinary medicine. And I think this story is a story of mentorship. The more I the more I think of it, because another amazing mentor um, knew that I was considering a change, and she called me. She said that there is a new veterinary technology program that is going to be starting at Appalachian State University, and they're looking for a veterinarian to be the program director. Is that something that you would be interested in? Because I think you'd be really good at it. As I've shared before, I laughed and I thought there's no way I could do that. I don't know anything about veterinary technology education. I my, my best friends that I work with are veterinary technicians. I respect them immensely and I could not do my job without them. But I just don't know anything about that whole aspect of veterinary medical education. She said, I, I just think you should think about it. You know, she's very gentle and confidence boosting at the same time. And, and so I thought about it and I said, wow, you know, what an opportunity to, to start a new program, to start from, from scratch. 
and say, okay, here are the challenges that I've experienced. Here are the challenges that I see out there. What could I do about that? Could I help and make a difference? I interviewed and was really fortunate to be selected. And since September 2021, I've been the program director here at Appalachian State University of the new four-year bachelor's program in veterinary technology. So what I, I never would have thought that this was possible. And it's been an amazing, amazing experience. Hi, we'll be back with the second half of the show after this quick break. But first, I wanted to take a moment and thank you for listening to the Vet Life Reimagined podcast. If you're enjoying the show, the best way to support us is to leave a rating and review on your favorite podcast app. It really helps us to reach more listeners, and we really appreciate it. Thanks for listening. And now back to the episode. Well, okay, so you've done this now for over a year. And I can only imagine you've learned so much in that one year. So what have you learned? What are you excited about? What did you, because you, I mean, you felt like you didn't know anything. And so I'm pretty sure you you probably have enough now that you're, you're confident that, you know, there, there are things that can, that are done well, things that can be done better. I think, like I said before, so what have you learned? Um, I have learned to be humble because I thought I knew some things and I still feel like I'm learning a lot. I admit I carry around the AVMA accreditation guidelines with me everywhere I go and I'm constantly rereading them because there's so much to know, uh, so many details. And yeah, when I when I started the position, I just I had to be a sponge. I had to learn everything I just went to my LinkedIn profile. I went to all of these virtual conferences because COVID was still really a factor at that point. And I just reached out to as many people as I could. And I said, I really want to talk to you. I want to learn from you. I want to understand what the issues are. I want to understand what works well. What are the challenges? What could be done better? Um, Because, you know, plot twist, it's an online program. And I had never worked in an online program before. Of course, with COVID, we were teaching our students online, but it was very, you know, let's get on Zoom and talk about cases. And, you know, it wasn't very um, methodical as as we all felt that way. And so I had to not only learn all there was about veterinary technology education, I had to really become a bookworm on online education and online program development. And I'm still on that learning curve. I, I will say, I think since vet school, it's definitely been the, the the most dramatic learning curve I think I've had, and and I just really had to be humble and and know what I didn't know, you know, un- understand and recognize what I didn't know, and and I'm still there, and and I think what what I've learned is the most important thing that I've learned is to surround myself with an excellent team. And I think that is the number one thing that I'm the most proud of is I spent a lot of time and a lot of effort recruiting and fortunately hiring some of the very best people. And they have lifted me up because the gaps, the strengths that I didn't have, you know, they've really jumped right in and and had those things. And so we've worked really well together. So I've I've learned a lot about, you know, the ins and outs of of creating a new program. working through all those administrative steps and and really it's about people you know it's about finding the right people and passion really shines through even if it's through the screen and so building an online program what's been really important to me is to find people who not only are just really um amazing at what they do in veterinary medicine skilled um you know technically and and in their knowledge They also really need to have that passion because um, we have to kind of go above and beyond, I think, to really engage our students when it comes to being online. Um, There's there's more barriers than when you're in person. So I think that's the number one thing that I've learned is surround yourself with amazing people and spend a lot of time and a lot of effort to find them and to keep them. Yeah. Oh, I think that's such a good lesson for work for life is to have that good team around you and the idea of a a virtual program is is fascinating you know we live in a time where finding people to be in clinic you know understaffing those types of things are, are concerns so it's common conversation to talk about well how do we improve that 
we could build more programs if we were virtual and there were no geographical concerns. That said, both veterinarian as well as veterinary technician have a lot of clinical skills, technical skills that we need to learn that are very hard to do virtually. So how have you overcome that barrier? To me, that was the biggest piece of that learning curve. I I had to really sit down and say, okay, how do you do a really good online program when veterinary medicine and veterinary technology and veterinary nursing is so hands-on? So for that, I looked to the other online veterinary technology programs. There, um, There's about 10 total. And I, I talked to them. I said, hey, what's, you know, how do you do this? How do you integrate the hands-on skills and the, you know, the essential skills training with the didactic learning. I think that that's that's really the key is figuring out how to do that part because I really believe strongly, you know, in the the philosophy that we don't learn through experience, we learn by reflecting on experience. Mm -hmm. So there's there's these safe spaces to create this reflective practice, um, so that this day to day in and out work and the clinic can actually come back to, you know, these safe spaces and facilitated conversations. And, and that really leads to some, some growth and excellent learning opportunities. And the students will also be doing focused clinical externships during their summer. So that's where they're going to be focusing on those essential skills. So the CBTEA, the Committee on Veterinary Technician Education and Activities, uh, through the AVMA, has over 350 psychomotor and didactic skills that our students have to be able to accomplish by the time they graduate. And so that's that's really the... Um, where the rubber meets the road is making sure that they're able to do all of those technical skills competently by the time they graduate. So we're really um, focusing right now on developing clinical affiliate sites. And if anyone out there is interested in being a clinical affiliate site with our program, we are actively recruiting. And we really want to get to attract the high quality programs and clinical sites that our students will be able to thrive in. And we have not been, it has not been an issue. Uh, we have many, many interested clinics because of course the workforce shortage is, is quite real. And what a better way to attract, retain, and grow your veterinary technicians and nurses, put them through school, you know, hire them as a veterinary assistant then help them to go through an online veterinary technology program like the one here at App State. And then they get to learn alongside your staff and, and you, and, um, and you really support them through that incredibly important aspect of their life, which is their education. So we're really, really proud to be able to fill that gap. There is 100% uh, the need for, for in-person brick and mortar veterinary technology programs as well. What, what we know is that some students learn better in person, some are, learn better online because they have that, that drive, you know, they're able to be very self-motivated. They have a lot of intrinsic motivation and those are the students who really um, will do best. And we have students coming to us who feel that way. That being said, not every student is going to feel that way or to have that strength. So I, I love that there are both types of programs out there. And so I think that they really complement one another very well. Yeah. This is an opportunity to add value to veterinary assistants and in, in the hospital and all, all of those benefits that you listed. And I like that you approach this opportunity, this challenge by asking questions. And so as you it sounds like you are very attuned with the students and the students, most of them are working in clinic at the same time. What are you hearing from the the veterinary technicians today? Because I've, I've have had several veterinary technicians on, there are definitely some challenges. So, and I'm curious as what are they expressing as concerns when it comes to jobs and and just overall environment of veterinary medicine. But then on the flip side, what are they excited about? What keeps them excited to, to be doing these classes and to stay in this profession? I, I think that's a fantastic question. And I think that the narrative is being heard. 
by the pipeline of students that we've recruited and an earlier. And I think there are positives and negatives of the narrative. On the positive side, I think the message of it's a great time to get a job in veterinary medicine is out there. I think that the message of th there's a workforce shortage and we need veterinary technicians and you will have multiple job opportunities, that, that is getting out there. And they very much understand that this is a fantastic time for them to be educating themselves in the field of veterinary technology. On the negative side, the narrative of um, burnout, of low wages, of um, job dissatisfaction, and poor retention, particularly of veterinary technicians, credential veterinary technicians is, is also out there. And in this program and in life, I should say, I, I really value transparent communication. And I think you have to have both sides of that narrative because they're they're both true. And so we're, we're quite clear with the students in their first course, you know, we, we lay the landscape and we get different voices. We have a diverse um, set of, of, you know, both existing content as well as guest lecturers that come in and, and provide their story. And, and so with the challenges in mind, these students are amazing. They understand that these are the challenges and it's not going to just fix itself overnight. It takes a village, as I think you've mentioned before, Megan, to, um, to come together. And it really is going to take um, all of us to see what impact that we can have to make these things better. And so I think that what, what they are really fortunate to have in this program is extremely strong mentors and all of my faculty and staff and, you know, all of the interactions that they're having are with prudential veterinary technicians who are absolutely incredible and are very positive, um, but also don't sugarcoat, you know, here are the challenges, they're out there. What we're really aiming to do is to create a program that will help equip our students with not only those essential technical competencies, and also they will be learning about well-being. They'll be learning about communication, leadership, teamwork, these aspects that haven't been as focused on, but really need to be. When we think about what are the skills? What are the tools we can put in their toolbox to help them really thrive and succeed? Because we need them. We need them to be leaders. We need them to step up and to be part of the conversation and to advocate for the profession. And we need more of that. And uh, interestingly, there actually was a study looking at graduates of bachelor's programs in veterinary technology and graduates of associate's degree programs in veterinary technology. And it turns out that statistically, they are much more likely to stay in the field longer with a bachelor's degree. And I think that's really interesting. And I think, I don't know all the reasons why. My thoughts on it are that they have so many different options available to them. So for example, I know I have colleagues, friends who love the field of veterinary medicine, but physically just can't do it anymore. There's, you know, for one reason or another or life um, circumstances and, you know, say, okay, well, where, where can I take this next without leaving the field entirely? So I'm really proud that we have developed advanced level courses that will provide them those different types of career paths so they can stay in veterinary medicine, even if it looks a little bit different than the traditional clinical path. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And I like how you are, you you said you were adding on like the well being and, and all of those other concepts. And Pulling back something that you said earlier, and I probably won't say it just right, but it's you, you don't learn by doing, but you learn by reflecting on what you, what you did or something. How did, how did it go? Did I say that right? Yes. Very close. So we don't learn by experience. We learn by reflecting on experience. Yes. And I like how this particular program, the way it's designed, especially with so many actively in clinic you can reflect not only on the clinical skills, but what about, I mean, if they're they're already seeing the burnout, you have that opportunity to reflect on that with them. So I, I think that's a really special thing about this program. And I think some of these things can be carried out beyond the program, but I'm glad that that is there for them. And then maybe 
you're training leaders as well. They're going to go out and hopefully be able to take those skills, uh, those reflecting skills out and teach them to other people in the hospital. Have, have you had any really good stories about students that have learned something in the program and they've come back and kind of shared that story? Yeah, that's a great question. Now, the program is, is so brand new. We've only been around for one semester. We started in oh, August. So um, I have many wonderful stories have been shared. And I think, you know, just getting started the first semester, what I heard a lot of, so we actually, we're doing things a little bit differently in terms of having this be an online program. We're having the students work as teams from the beginning. Um, they, they're doing, yeah, they're doing all team-based learning. Thank you to Dr. Holly Bender at the University of Arizona uh, College of Veterinary Medicine. She walked us through how to do team-based learning. That's, that's how they do the curriculum at the new vet school at the University of Arizona. And we were just super fascinated. We said, yep, let's do that. So, you know, not only are we doing all these other new things, we said, let's, let's jump into this. And so, but it's been really, really fun because, you know, I, I truly believe that teams, that's where we need to be educating our students. We can't teach them anymore that, um, and I'm speaking for the veterinary students too here from my own past experience that we can't be everything to everyone all the time. It's really important to understand your strengths, understand where you need to work on per personally, professionally, technically, and how you work as a team to improve outcomes for your patients and for your clients. And so we're really um, working to instill that from the very beginning of this program. And so this semester, I'm really excited because we actually have our first communication specific course and I'm co-teaching that, um, but we're also working on that kind of more informally as they get started in the program. So they're working in small teams of five to seven. And, and a lot of the feedback that we had was, I really enjoyed working with my team. I learned a lot from my teammates. Um, some of them are coming in with zero experience in a veterinary clinic. Some of them are coming in with lots of experience. And so they're learning from each other. And so they're, you know, they're reflecting on those experiences that they've had or even through kind of um, secondary reflection. Oh, it was really interesting to hear my teammate talk about this case that they saw yesterday, you know, even going to tough conversations like euthanasia, you know, some students have never experienced that before. So having opening the door to having these conversations right from the start and hearing what others are experiencing and then being able to take that back to reflect on, well, how might I handle that? when I have to deal with that at some point in this, in this profession. So that's really mostly the feedback that's been so far is, is working in teams and this communication and um, kind of the, the powerful impact that that can have. And, you know, going back, I'm like, Ooh, I wish I would have had that. You know, I, I remember, um, you know, working with small groups, I just loved it. And so I'm excited to keep working with that. Yeah. Well, and, Something you said brought up another question. You said that some of the students come in zero experience and then some, you know, they're actively working in clinic. What is the admissions process for veterinary technicians? I know I experience more on the, the veterinary side, but what is what is the admissions process and, and what have you kind of learned about that aspect of the program? That's a great question. And we're adapting our admissions process right now. So it still has to go through some layers of the onion because it's a university. Um, we're What we're aiming for is to have our students take our two introductory courses, which includes a observation requirement in a veterinary clinical setting. And then they're able to declare the major. And the benefit of that is that we can, you know, open their eyes to the field, of course, because, you know, those coming in with an interest and a passion, but maybe not a lot of um, knowledge or experience, or they can see what the profession is. And we also get a lot of questions about, well, I really want to go to veterinary school. And we say, well, it's if you want to go to veterinary school, that is a different route. You know, think about this as being like a human nursing program for veterinary medicine. So if you want to become a doctor, you would go to medical school. If you want to become a nurse, you go to nursing school. So this is the equivalent of nursing school for veterinary medicine. So it kind of clears up those different types of paths as, as well. And then we get to know our students. We get to know them in that semester. And we say, you know, we we can have good you know, feedback and advising with them so that we can really help to make sure that this is exactly what they want 
when they sign up for for four years. And so that's really what we're aiming to, aiming to implement as far as an admissions process. Yeah, that's it's interesting because I had a a conversation with a veterinary technician about the challenges of people who don't have a lot of experience. And um, she said that some clinics don't want to hire them without any experience. And she's like, well, somebody has to let them have (laughs) that experience. I like the idea of you, you have a, like some classes or opportunities for them to actually understand maybe what they're getting into, make sure that it is something they want to continue to pursue. So I, I think that's, that's really important. Going forward, what is something that you are are really excited about when it comes to education of veterinary medicine? I love I love it. And it really lights me up to think about if we reimagine what veterinary medical education could look like. And I think that education has a huge role to play when it comes to thinking about all the challenges that we're facing in veterinary medicine, because how are we setting up our future colleagues? Are we setting them up for success? Are we setting them up to thrive and to have a sustainable career? And education has to adapt. You know, it's, it's a slow moving system because there's so, you know, there's a lot of people involved. There's a lot of processes involved and there's a lot of institutional memory and, there's a lot of wonderful things about that because the you know, faculty in veterinary medical education, you know, tend to be just really passionate, um, incredible people who care very deeply about the profession. At the same time, the reality is that the world is changing and it's changing really, really fast. And I, I worry about just doing things the way they've always been done because I just don't think it's working. And in my experience, you know, my story is after I graduated from veterinary school, I had a phenomenal experience, as I mentioned before, and it threw the very best class ever. I, I really believe so. We just had an amazing family, like four years together. Um, I felt like I could take on the world. At the same time, I didn't really understand what the team looked like and what role I would play in the team. And I had the inclination to think that I had to do everything. You know, that's kind of how you learn. You say, well, I've got to be the anesthetist and I've got to be able to draw blood. I've got to be able to intubate. I've got to be able to do all these surgeries. I've got to be able to um, talk preventative care. I've got to be able to see an exotic patient that walks in the door. And for me, that certainly led to a lot of stress and, and strain. And I didn't understand, I was fortunate to be very surrounded by a phenomenal, you know, veterinary um, team around me when I was in my internship, you know, technicians, assistants, doctors, all all of them. But I didn't understand how to, how we work together because it wasn't ever really when we were in school. Of course, I knew that if you needed a question answered when you're on clinics, you know, go speak to the to the veterinary technician on your service. And, you know, please don't make them upset because they're so important. And you really needed to become, um, they were your advocate and they knew what to do and they knew how to teach you how to do stuff. And so I, that's how I understood, but I didn't understand how, when I graduated, how we were going to work together. And so really what my my vision and my passion has become is this idea of um, interprofessional education and what that could look like for veterinary medical education moving forward. So, you know, traditionally in veterinary medicine, when we think of interprofessional education, it's been thought of a lot of, okay, we let's put some veterinary students with medical students, with pharmacy students and dentistry students. And that's great. And that's one health in action. However, For most veterinarians graduating, going to work out in clinical practice, that's not your team. Mm. Your team is your the 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 doctors, the credentialed veterinary technicians, the veterinary assistants, your practice managers. If you're lucky enough, you might have a veterinary social worker. There's a there's a different team. You know, this is your day in, your day out, your team. And so I am really fascinated by the idea of putting that into veterinary education right from the start. 
in an ideal world, I would love to see veterinary technicians and veterinary medical students being educated together through their four years, because there are so many things that are foundational to the success of both. And what an amazing opportunity and a safe, controlled environment of school and um, having, you know, trained instructors, facilitators to help to, you know, to model this. Um, couldn't we look at different models of veterinary education that really center on the team and what the impact on outcomes could be? And I think things like well-being, communication, teamwork really are the, you know, that that's so crucial to everyone. So couldn't we all learn these skills together and learn how they they all intersect and interact when we get out into clinical practice or whatever type of veterinary medicine we want to, to be in. And I think to me, that feels like we're setting our future colleagues up better for success. Um, so I'm really fascinated by this. And there's a little bit of work that's being done over in the UK because they have at the Royal Veterinary College they and others, they have veterinary nursing programs side by side with their, their DVM education program. So in, over in the, in, um, in other countries, we can officially call them veterinary nurses. Um, we're not quite there yet here in the United States, of course. And and so I'm really, um, I'm learning a lot and I'd love to learn more. I really want to know what that could look like. And I think the idea of a high functioning team could really transform veterinary medicine and thinking about, you know, how do we use our strengths? How do we stop trying to be everything to everyone all the time? It's just not sustainable. I know it wasn't for me. And what if we could look at it as a team and how do we, you know, take the foundations of well-being and then where we want to go with access to care, spectrum of care, one health. I think the the middle part is missing. To me, it is the team because the team has to have the tools in their toolbox. They have to know how to do well-being. They have to know themselves, you know, self-awareness, empathy, these foundational skills that amazingly enough can be taught. And then they have to go out there and do that work that needs to be done. But it's really that team. It's, it's who's doing the work. Could we could we foster that? Could we do that better so that they were setting them up for success, setting up these leaders who are really going to transform the field and uh, make it better for everyone and the future generations. Well, I love your vision. And so now I have to go hunt down the the Royal College and find someone to bring on and talk a little bit about how they run that type of program. So again, I was, you took the next question out of my mouth. I was like, so where do we start? And so it sounds like there are some places that are already implementing this idea. And so we can potentially learn from them. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Um, Our time has just left us. So I'm going to wrap up with our final four questions. And the first one is, what is something that people may get wrong about you? I feel like the older I get, the more of an open book that I become. <laughs> However, I don't know, being a mother is, is uh, in, in a DVM and a mom at the same time, I think is, can be a, a, a a lonely space sometimes because mm. um, there's just so much outside of my life as a veterinarian that is so incredibly important to me. So they they may not see that part of me because I'm, you know, I am heart and soul, 100% passionate about being a veterinarian. And this is what I've always wanted to do. However, I, I'm also a mother. And um, when I turn my computer off, it's my full intention to be right there and present with my kids. And um, as much as I'm working on these, you know, well-being, leadership, communication, these aspects that I think are just incredibly important to to learn more about personally, as well as put into this program, I'm, I'm working on with my kids. Quick example, we worked on glitter jars over the weekend and glitter jars are a really fun way to calm down your amygdala and activate your prefrontal cortex. And there's a really beautiful video kind of watching the glitter, you know, come down from the jar. And it was an amazing moment. And I, I think I want to send all my students a glitter jar because, you know, just when they kind of get it, like, oh, I, I can stop if I feel upset, if I feel myself getting stressed just watch the glitter jar fall. And so people might miss that 
how much I really, I, I don't, feel, I'm not just saying these things. It's, it's really just a part of who I am and a part of what I'm working on with my, with my kids too. What a fabulous answer. And now I have to go find out how to make a glitter jar. So thank you for that. Perfect. The second question is, what is a hidden skill or interest that you have? Oh, I love this question because I actually recently activated it. And I am a secret scrapbook lover. If you set me loose in Michael's, I could be there for hours finding stickers, glitter, um, all the embellishments. And I like to call it BK before kids. I had lots of time to make scrapbooks and I loved it because I love just treasuring those memories. And um, that's the little piece of me that can be creative. And actually over the weekend, um, the other, because it was really cold and snowy and yucky here in Boone. And so not only did we make glitter jars, I also made a vision board. And this is something I learned about. I am the other thing people may not know about me. I get up at 4 a.m. every day and right behind me is my Peloton bike. And I'm absolutely dedicated to my Peloton bike. And my favorite instructor is Robin Arzon, and she's amazing. And I watched her master class recently, which I highly recommend. And she talks about making a vision board. And it's it's kind of like a large version of a one page scrapbook and you put um you print out pictures or images or words you know anything that kind of speaks to you calls to you some you know s- somewhere you want to go something you want to achieve and so my my oldest son and I uh, yesterday afternoon we just sat down and printed off pictures and talked and um you can't see it now but my vision board has been started and it was so much fun and it kind of activated that that scrapbooking part of me that loves to just like throw pictures up and then we would just talk about it. You know, what does it mean? Um, what does that mean to you? And what it meant to me was something different to him. And it was so much fun. You were the coolest mom ever. Um, <laughs> uh, that is such a good activity for for anyone. But I love that you're doing that with your kids because it's it's showing them that they can have visions and to be able to to talk about these things at such an, an a young age i think is so important so that that's amazing these are this is this is great i could just like clip these questions out and it, this would be so helpful uh, the third question is um what is something on your bucket list right now i'm going to just say it out loud because it's on my vision board i really want to go to antarctica oh um, I wanted to go see the penguins and I um, I know our time is running out, but I'll make this really quick. I'm actually, I'm part of a um, leadership program for women in STEM that I've been doing over the past year called Homeward Bound. And it's been all online. And the culmination of it is to send um, 100 women in STEM every year to, on this voyage to Antarctica. And they had to not do it for the, you know, during COVID. And now it's opening back up again. And I have to figure out how to get myself there. It's not cheap. Um, but now that I see that it's possible, um, I really want to go. And, uh, you know, for a number of reasons. And you know, I just, I really feel like I need to see what the impact of climate change really is in, in the world. And then to have that opportunity to really be with, you know, hundred women leaders from all over the world, it's just, it takes my breath away. So I will say that's probably the top thing on my bucket list right now is to figure out how to get there. That sounds incredible. Oh, wow. And finally, your last question is what is something you are most grateful for? I am a huge devotee of gratitude. And I have developed a very, um, I I hope a longstanding habit of journaling about gratitude every day. I have, um, it's called the five minute journal and it's very short. You know, in the morning, I write down three things I'm grateful for. And in the evening, you know, three things that, that went well that day. And so I would say um, for the, you know, I would say it's always my, my children, you know, my family, my home, you know, just being safe, being loved um, and and learning and growing are things I'm just so grateful for um, having the space and the opportunity and being lifted up by such amazing mentors in my career that um, that I've I'm just so grateful for all of it. And um, but really, my my North Star is, you know, my my core, you know, is is my family and my children. And um, I want them to come on all my adventures with me and I want them to be a part of it. And I want them to experience it because 
I want them to see that, you know, it's not just mommy goes to work, then mommy is with you, you know, how, how can we be a part of this adventure together? So, so I'm so grateful for opportunities when that gets to happen and um, really take them on this journey with me. This has been the Vet Life Reimagined podcast. Whether you are listening or watching on YouTube, I hope you enjoyed this conversation. Please make sure you are subscribed to catch all these amazing people in our profession. Also, send this episode to someone you think who would appreciate it. Have a recommendation for someone who would be a good guest? Please reach out on LinkedIn, Instagram, or Facebook. There aren't that many Dr. Sprinkles. Until next time, Vet Lifers.